in some ways, as I say more, because some of you guys are connected with the limits work, and this is, this is more, uh, as you'll see towards the end, this feeds in, into the limits work more. And this is um, with Dan Sheen, who joined me at Kai this, this, this year. Um, this is work that's been going on for quite a while now. It started in 2012 with The Guardian. And um, you'll see what we, um, why we got involved with The Guardian, so I'll skip through my book. Those again. Okay. So the environment, we, have a, we created an environment which is called Simpact. And Simpact is a modeling environment which allows you to model digital services like originally the Guardian website, the Guardian videos, uh, Facebook, YouTube, etc. Um, and allows you to model a digital service and understand how much energy is used to deploy that service effectively, to get an estimate of that. So that's what we did. Um, so it allows you to ask questions like, what is the overall impact of a service and where are the hotspots? And why we think this is important, and this is really a kind of what I'm trying to, you know, kind of my key message for those of us who are in design, who, are, who attend things like Kai, is that digital services, we, we already know, we already know that digital services aren't free. But what we don't realize is, in fact, that if you take a digital service which is deployed, each individual, digi each, each person who uses a digital service, the footprint is relatively small. But if you have, uh, you know, there's 8 billion in the world, uh, uh, of whom about, you know, kind of 2 to 3 billion are on the internet, um, it adds up. You see what I mean? Yeah. It adds up. And so, so digital services, they're not like flights, but they, they, it does add up. What, uh, the, the impact of digital services does add up. It's worth doing something about. Um, so where are the hotspots in digital service, and how do the, design in, how do the designs we make in digital service change? Where, uh, how can we have like, alternate design decisions? Like where do we cache information? How do users interact with it? Those are the kind of questions. And how is customer ch behavior changing over time? So in The Guardian, we were looking at the move to mobile devices, the move away from uh, desktop, laptop access towards mobile. And they were, they were releasing services which encourage mobile use. So how might technology advances change? So how are customer behavior changing? How might technology advances change? And so what might the footprint be in 20 years' time? And this is a key question for the BBC. The work we're doing with the BBC at the moment is imagine if we switch off our broadcast transmitters and replace it with uh, IP streaming completely, you know, moving to a Netflix model. What will the impact on the UK's energy demand be of that using current technology? And the answer is uh, significant. But how is technology advancing over time which might mitigate that? How can we put in models of how um, uh, network technology is changing over time? And uh, what, will the, what will the energy impact in 20 years be? So those are the kind of questions we ask. So the environment, so I don't know how many of you have played with life cycle analysis, a useful tool uh, for understanding uh, the impact of the carbon footprint. If ever you see something that says carbon footprint, that means they've used at least in theory, some form of life cycle analysis model to get that. Uh, and uh, doing a good life cycle analysis historically will take one person's PhD. Um, doing a bad life cycle analysis will involve paying a consultant £20,000 and, uh, and waiting um, two months. Um, but, but our environment allows, uh, so what, what we've done, in fact, is create an environment with a lot of data behind it, which allows you to put together quite rigorous uh, analyses in a couple of weeks if you have expertise in the environment. And so it's kind of trying to make <coughs> it uh, a faster thing for digital services. Um, it's highly detailed, and we've got lots of a rich data set in the background. And it's integrated directly with certain online energy sources, like, uh, sorry, data sources like Energy Star. It integrates with the Energy Star database. So it knows what is the energy efficiency of various different models of computers combines that with sales data to give you an estimate of a typical laptop and a distribution uh, of um, en energy um, performance of a typical laptop. Yeah. Um, it's also integrated with analytics systems, which allows us, so in the case of The Guardian, we use analytics information from The Guardian about how people are actually using the website. So rather than, again, having a typical customer, you could actually have the spread of customer behaviors. And uh, conceptually, this isn't quite what we did, but conceptually you could work out the actual energy use for each individual customer and add them all together to get the total energy use. Um, we actually put them into clusters, but that's effectively what's going on. Um, visual dashboards, so you can see what's going on in real time, see how things are changing as you release a new, a new service. And also, what if analysis to allow you to think about longer term future scenarios, um, which I alluded to earlier on. So this is kind of what the model looks like. We've got our devices, various user devices, Various kinds of networks, mobile networks, um, uh, home networks, then the edge networks in cities, the um, core network, 
various the cloud provider services um, and quite detailed information about the core network. So Dan did a great piece of work uh, which basically used a trace route uh, and location to identify, um, uh, to get an estimate for how many undersea uh, repeaters there were on undersea cables. But then when he did the stats analysis of it, he found that was almost insignificant compared with the overall footprint. So he did a lot of work on finding a lot of information about something that in the end appears to be almost irrelevant. Um, but that's the way academics, you know, it's part of the academic life. It gets you a PhD, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so this is what we got out of the Guardian. This, is a foot this now appears in the Guardian Sustainability Report each year, and they update it. They have a, a spreadsheet compilation of our model, which allows them to put in information. And they are the first organization that reports on their digital carbon footprint as part of their overall. So there are some organizations like Google, which report on their data centers, but they don't include network use, end, end customer use, etc. So Guardian is the first, and as far as we know, the only, still, still the only organization which does this. It's interesting to see, this is for the Guardian, the Guardian is not really a video service, it's mainly, it's for some video, but it's mainly uh, web content. This is its digital footprint. And if you see, that is smaller than this part here. And this part here is um, the footprint of actually creating the news. This is mainly off running the office, the office data center and flying around the world to trouble spots. That's, so that's that footprint. So you see that the digital footprint is slightly smaller. This is the, the paper footprint. That's how much energy is used to um, print, print the paper and to make the paper it's printed on um, and ship it around the place. So that's now in their report. And this, of course, what we're expecting to see is that this will grow and this will shrink over time. But they are, keep, they are monitoring it and thinking about it. So, and as I say, they're the first organization which does this. OK, so as I said, it allows dashboards and live analytics. Again, this is, um, it's kind of, this is data from The Guardian. It's uh, deliberately fuzzed out so you can't get the exact details. But you'll see over time here, what's going on is that the um, mobile, um, more mobile usage means that the blue area is the user devices. So the user devices is going down, but the um, network usage is going up over time because the mobile devices are using more network but less energy actually the end devices. So this is a video streaming service. Um, this, Dan basically knocked up a estimate of YouTube. I'm not going to give, uh, we don't want to go public on it until you've checked his estimate. But uh, what I would say is that um, if you look at YouTube is a really good example of a system that for each individual customer it's relatively small the footprint but so many people use YouTube that it will add up to uh, a kind of a few full jumbo jets month uh, month worth of uh, um, carbon emissions so it's, it's non-trivial it's not a whole airport's worth but it's something that's worth doing something about uh, so this is the the model of YouTube it's Dan did it based on public domain information that um, Google have released and some guesses where Google don't have information. He's, he's uh, putting guesses and then he's used our data about uh, data center performance, etc., in there to get an estimate for what the YouTube um, footprint would be. And as I say, it took him about, uh, it took him years to do the Guardian work, but now that he's got the infrastructure in place, it took him about a week to do this. So the system allows, now allows uh, quite quick analysis. And this, again, because I, I, I want to be really sure about the numbers before we go public, about exactly what those numbers are, so I've not put the numbers in. But you will see, this is again based on their information. Um, you see this part here is the wireless network. And the wireless network is a substantial amount of the footprint. And you also see the growth that's going on here. Growth over time, again, based on their, their figures of um, increased growth of YouTube. So. Um, the other thing to say is that their data centers, let me get this right, uh, I can't quite, um, so, is, yeah, okay, so their data centers is this one here. And the thing about, so Google have a policy of green energy, um, and for their search work, that's a really good strategy, because almost all the energy that's associated with search work, which is very data center intensive, but network light, is going to be in the data center. So it's a very good green strategy. And the Google, I will say Google have done fantastic work on data centers. They have uh, reduced the energy use in their data centers and also been quite public about how they've done it. So they've encouraged others. But if you look at YouTube, you'll see that a data center energy reduction strategy and green energy strategy only addresses a small amount. 
of the overall footprint of YouTube. Most of the footprint of YouTube is in the network. And so if Google are serious about being green about YouTube, they need to think about how they can reduce energy use in the network and support network operators uh, on using it more efficiently. And there's, um, let's just carry on, I think there might be. So what, and this is a good example of where I believe that organizations like Google, Facebook, et cetera, need to have in their um, thinking the concept of design for environment and digital services. And this is something that already exists. It's very commonplace. Uh, design for environment of, of physical devices like uh, Apple, uh, HP laptops, etc. They have someone whose job it is to advocate environmental issues in the design of a physical device in terms of uh, making the device energy efficient, um, making the uh, device use less, uh, less materials, making the device use less toxic materials, etc. They have someone whose job it is to advocate the environment. They won't always get their way, of course, quite rightly. You know, if you're in a, in a business, you need to take these things into, but, but it is part of the process to make sure that it's considered. Uh, and in fact, in the, the paper before I presented, our paper at Kai was exactly about this, about the culture that exists in those, and it's worth reading. Um, so, but what you don't find is people thinking about digital services in this way. And I believe that given the large impact of digital services, this is something that companies need to start thinking about. They need to quantify the impact of services, look at the alternate design decisions they're making and how that affects the impact, and make those design decisions at least partly influenced by environmental factors, energy use, etc. And identify hotspots and use those to target research and innovation uh, efforts. So that's kind of... For the, for the companies, this is my message. My message is that you guys need to think about design, end-to-end -end design for environment digital services, and I hope they do. Um, so let's have a look at a video streaming network like, um, uh, like YouTube. How would this play out for something like YouTube? So as I said, even with conservative assumptions, Dan made some conservative assumptions about mobile network use, the mobile network dominates. So how can you design to reduce energy use in divine, uh, mobile network? The first would be, Look, find out when someone is using a mobile device um, and nudge to a lower resolution. So at the moment, uh, there already is, you, you'll have the best resolution, often you'll have the best resolution that your device can accept. But the thing is, that's more than you need for a lot of these things. So it's more than you need. And we, can, we have ways, uh, Google already has ways of experimenting to think about, uh, to find out what your views are about, for example, advertising placement. They could do the same to find out what your views on resolution are have a default lower resolution view which allows you to pump it up a bit if you're not happy and then they can see how many people pump it up and move the default as appropriate. That will use less energy in the network. Yeah. Um, avoid waste. So I don't know how many of you use, use YouTube as your free um, music streaming service. Um, yeah, a few of you. Yeah, okay. So if you do that, you probably have it running in the background. Nonetheless, the network is still, uh, the data centers and network is still pumping video to you which is just uh, sitting there. So that is digital waste. It's significant amount of digital waste. As I said, uh, YouTube, so this is very ballpark figures. Well, I'm, I need to check these, but YouTube is equivalent to a few full jumbo jets of people flying back and forth from the UK a uh, month. I would say that the waste is about 11% of the total, based on our um, estimate, again, conservative estimates, which is about equivalent to um, at least one full jumbo jet flying back and forth between Europe and the UK per, um, uh, per month, you know, just order of magnitude, yes. Um, so that's something that we can be done. That, that would be quite simple to sort out. It might be harder from a legal point of view, but uh, from a technical point of view, it would be easy to tell if it's in the background and then just switch to audio, yeah. Um, advanced local caching of content over Wi-Fi. So uh, Wi-Fi is a um, sparsely used resource, whereas the mobile network is a heavily used resource. And if we want to discourage a mobile network expansion, then what we want to do is try to push work away from that into, into Wi-Fi, which is, as I say, an inefficient use resource. So what you could do is cache. When you're, when you're near a Wi-Fi device, you cache content, which can then be played to you later on, you know, based on your preferences, etc. And that will reduce the pressure on the mobile network. Um, uh, when you've got a peak period on the, on the um, network, you could throttle back. You could, you could uh, have default lower resolution at that time, for example. And also, uh, look at alternate delivery architectures to exploit waste capacity, like cooperative local Wi-Fi networks. So if I was at Google, I would be talking to um, network providers about alternative ways of more efficiently providing the mobile service over time. 
So that is about making products greener, but, um, and I think that's important, but that's only one step. And this is the limits agenda. And so, I, I particularly, so in terms of limits, the, the limits that I believe from an environmental point of view are most rigorous are what are called planetary boundaries, which you guys probably have come across. Uh, there's lots of great work on understanding what planetary boundaries are. Obviously climate change, but other factors as well. The number, um, uh, what are the planetary boundaries which we must uh, stay within? Um, and what I would say about, uh, I believe that, um, so I'm from Europe, which means I'm probably more statist in approach than many of you. Um, uh, so I believe that each sector needs to think about how they can have their share um, so each, each industry or industrial sector which is providing us with the services that we want, whether it's um, uh, you know, homes, whether it's digital services, whether it's transport or what travel, uh, each sector needs to think about how they can redesign themselves to deliver to all 8 billion of us an appropriate quality of service. That's what I believe needs to be done. And to do that, part of that needs to, be, to quantify what you're doing. And if you think about purely aviation, so aviation is an interesting... Aviation and uh, digital services account, each, each account for about 2% of global emissions. Digital services slightly less, uh, if you include television, slightly more. Um, but they're both, they're, you know, roughly order of magnitude, similar size. Um, uh, and aviation is a very elitist technology in that each year about 5 to 6% of us fly. Um, probably most of us in the room, obviously I do. Um, uh, so about five, five, five to six percent of us fly uh, at least once in a year. Whereas internet, 40% of us in the world have home access to internet. And if you have kind of access via friends in villages, etc., then it goes beyond 40%. So even though um, techno uh, information technology and flying are roughly the same size, the uh, information technology is a more egalitarian technology in that it's shared among the world in a more fair way. Not completely fair, of course, but more fair than aviation is. Okay. And so it's a question. I, I think it's an important research question which our model can help answer. And that is, what quality of service, what level of service, can we imagine a world in which all 8 billion of us receive a level of service of digital um, uh, equivalent to what we receive currently in the West? Um, so can we imagine that? And in the case of aviation, as I say, the answer is definitely no. There's no way that improvements in aviation um, uh, efficiency, which is, uh, it improves about kind of 1.5% per year, um, uh, there's no way that we can deliver to the whole world the, the standard of aviation that, that the elite in the West, which we're all part of, uh, enjoys. However, in the case of digital technologies, the answer is not no. It might not be yes, but the answer is not no. And if I were a major technology provider who has aspirations to deliver services to the majority of the world, I would be asking this question seriously. And I would be saying, let us quantify the amount of energy and resources that are needed to deliver the kind of services that we want to to the whole world. Okay. And so that is part of the research that uh, Dan Sheen and I are now moving on towards. And uh, I think that's the end. That's the end. Yeah, okay, so that, that's, that's the various things. I'll just, uh, an advert, this is our Kai paper, which got a Best Paper Award. Um, uh, please read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, please, far away. So, the, the first two, basically, we, we publish in two kind of different areas. One is computer science, mainly Kai. And the other is the um, technical environmental science, uh, environmental technology. So that's the Journal of Industrial Ecology. That's the, uh, I've got a couple of papers in the Journal of Industrial Ecology. So we, we publish cross-boundary, kind of. We're very much interdisciplinary there. Um, but far away with questions and comments. So the Guardian has that environmental section. Did yeah. you ever publish there or have anything to do We've with We've had stuff on the website. Uh -huh. So um, the, uh, um, this work originally, so... Um, this work, the original work with the Guardian, originally came out because I was actually on a um, master's in action research at the University of Bath, which was focused on responsibility and business practice when I was at HP, together with uh, a Guardian environmental editor, environment, and uh, so that work came out of that. And so we do. Um, 
uh, we publish on the website. We've never had anything actually in the paper itself. But the, the website is the paper now. Yes, yeah, indeed. Yeah. The website is the paper. Yeah, yeah. So it seems like it would be good for many of us in this room to do that. Is there sort of a pathway for figuring out how to do to, that? To publish, to publish in, on that website. Um, to get our stuff out there. I, so I would say um, yes, there is the Guardian Sustainable Business um, Forum, um, and they would be interested. But the other thing, if you guys don't know about it, I think it's less known in the States, is if you go to the conversation, the conversation is a online um, newspaper which is edited uh, by academics and is primarily it's um, so it's a it's it's worth seeing. It started in Australia um, and it's in the UK and I think they're just starting in the US. And it's um, I've got an article I released an article last week about our work with Kai on it and that actually is a good venue as well. The thing about the Guardian, uh, what can I say about the Guardian? So our work has my work has appeared in their kind of responsibility section, which is about the company itself. It's, uh, they actually have a firewall between the editorial people, so I didn't have access to the editorial people. And the guy, my contact at the Guardian is now at Huffington Post, he's the kind of, I'm not sure exactly what his title is, but he's kind of bright futures uh, kind of person at uh, Huffington Post. Yeah. Have you given any thought um, as to uh, when you create your, um, like, for example, the Shut the Door app, yeah. and when you are going to have a relatively small user base, but following the same kind of, um, uh, you know, um, energy footprint principles that you've been talking about with these bigger companies, yeah. have you given any thought as to, like, the effectiveness of actually doing it, the practicality of doing it, and if it's worth the effort of putting into it in the long run. Do you mean of working out the energy footprint? Yes. Uh, whether um, it's whether it's worth working out the energy footprint for a small deployment. Yes. Um, we, uh, not in any formal way. I think um, we haven't done it for small things. And what I want to do is is look at a smart city in inverted commas and see what what is the impact of a smart city. I think it's it's not there's not a lot of value in doing something that's very small. Um, what there is, if it's something that you are planning on scaling up, then it's worth investing the time early on. So these technology companies will often say, hey, look at this, this service, it's going to save so many you know, tons of carbon if people use it. And if they make that claim, they need to have behind it also uh, how much energy is it using and therefore what is the net. You see? Yeah. But yeah, I would, I'm not sure it's, in some ways, for a service like Close the Door, then most of the energy will have been used in actually creating the service rather than running the service. Right, yeah. that's what it's mean. Yeah, yeah. And there is some work, which, I, which we reference in that paper, there's some work by guys at KTH, which um, showed that for a small online magazine, the bulk of the energy was used in actually creating it, not in deploying it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Totally on top of that, um, yeah. I, going back to uh, Close the Door, did you follow any particular type of software development method, or was it just completely agile? Well, it, it, it wasn't agile. It was an agile method, and we had uh, agile feedback. Uh, so it was, I wouldn't say it was, you know, kind of, so um, our team tends to use agile, um, uh, not necessarily rigorously following the exact kind of scrum method, but our, our team, my team tends to favor an agile approach in a kind of, a semi-formal agile approach, right? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks,